Kaur. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. A very good morning. Welcome to Bazaar Morning Call. We are live from the CNBC TV18 Motilal Oswal Studio here in Mumbai. I'm Sonia. With me is Lata and Nigel as always. Well, folks, good morning. We are beginning the day with slightly softer cues across the globe. In fact, the macro situation is not looking pretty. The U.S. markets opened up with a bit of a loss uh, after a long weekend. A lot of stocks, whether it's Tesla, Apple, have been under pressure on account of you know the weak macro as well as micro situation. In fact, uh, Tesla is now the lowest that we've seen since August of 2020. It missed expectations in terms of uh, Q4 deliveries as well. Apple is not looking good. For our own markets, though, the Nifty has had a smooth recovery. It's about a 2.5% recovery from the December lows of 17,800. The next level I'm watching is the 18,660 level, which was the peak that we hit on the 14th of December. It was a closing peak at that time. So I'll watch out for that level on the upside. The flows are still on the lower side as people get back to the markets. So, you know, just 350 crores of buying on the DI front. And lots of things to watch out for today. We'll talk about that in greater detail. But banks have been on the upside. There's some long addition in names like Axis Bank, which have been hitting life highs. There's fresh long positions in TCS yesterday ahead of their earnings on Monday. And there's a new listing as well, Radiant Cash Management. So more on that in a bit. But Nigel, Lata, good morning. Looks like it's going to be a slightly sticky start considering the global macro situation. Yeah, but we overcame them last two days. Today, I would think that it's, a, it's going to be a little more difficult to overcome simply because we are heading into the FOMC minutes and people may want to wait and watch. As you pointed out, the global queues are not extremely positive even today. Uh, if you looked at the uh, Nasdaq closing, not, uh, I mean, the pre-market queues are still not all that bad. Asian queues are also mixed. But the negativity comes from the fact that, uh, you know, Wall Street ended lower and the FOMC minutes come in. Uh, the positive from the global market is both crude and bond yields. U.S. bond yields are lower, mm. and that's usually India positive. Mm. So, uh, you know, it's not all bad, even if you looked at global queues. Domestic queues, the rupee weakening is a big positive. So, you know, whatever reverses we saw in the metal index yesterday could even be reversed today, because uh, that's a very big positive for, uh, you know, less competition from global uh, imported stuff. So exporters, metals likely to benefit. Airline numbers are superb. That shows an inherent strength. The uh, important point is, I think, uh, the banking uh, numbers. Number after number is indicating that December was very strong and the latest came from HDFC and Indicent Bank. Very strong loan growth. I'm ignoring the smaller ones, but all of them have shown such strong growth that it indicates clearly that something's going right in the economy. So. I think the Nifty would be, uh, you know, domestic queues may protect it at probably 18,100, which where we have repeatedly found support. And the global queues may stop it at about 18,400, where we have found resistance. But I don't think there's much stopping the Nifty bank. I mean, it's like, you know, lower highs and higher highs for the past year or so. And I think that's where the breakout may come. 44,000 can't be elusive for long. Well, uh, Lata, you know, the Nifty Bank, that's the crucial one that played a role yesterday. And that was the reason the Nifty ended in the green. And as you said, yes, Nifty Bank is going to be most important today because the IT index is likely to be under some pressure going by the global queue. So a couple of factors at play. The institutional flow is first up. Yesterday, the institutions, well, they net sold, repeatedly 280 crores or thereabouts. But the FI participation itself is 45 to 50 percent lower than what we have seen uh, on a normal day. I'm not talking about the last 10 days of December, but prior to that. Normally, in fact, you know, the participation would be much higher. So even as of yesterday, it's close to around 45 to 50 percent lower. What are the FIs doing the FNO market? Well, they added shots yet again. So they added close to 8,000 short contracts. And in the last three sessions, that's from the start of the series, the short positioning has gone up by close to around 25,000 short contracts. So now the short positioning that was at around 45 percent odd just a few sessions ago, that's moved to around 57 percent. Not a bad thing. You know, so they're adding shots in the index futures, but they're hedging themselves. Because in the index options, you know, they're bought calls, more calls and puts in the ratio of around 3 is to 1. And they're writing puts as well. That's telling you that maybe that base for the market, you know, that uh, was at around the 17,900, maybe it's heading to around the 18,050 in the near term, that is. What were they writing yesterday? You know, it appears there's a short straddle at play. What's the short straddle? The 18,200. You write both the call as well as the put. The premium between them, you pocket it. That's around 150 rupees. 
and you deduct it from 18,200 and you add it to 18,200. So the broad range is 18,050 to around 18,350. You now that's in the near term, that's the range that we're looking at going by the short stratum. But on the nifty banks, since that's going to be, you know, the joke on the back or the key uh, to, uh, to the nifty's move, well, the 43,300 strike was fairly active yesterday. That's on the put side. Uh, you know, the premium was uh, at around 150 rupees. Perfectly ties in. For those that are writing that particular put, you know, the 20 DMA comes in at around 43,170. So holding that is most important. The Nifty Bank needs to perform to take the Nifty higher in today's session. The IT index is likely to be on the back foot. HGX is suggesting a 50-point downtick. Today, I think, don't rush in there and buy it immediately. Wait for a little bigger dip. And then, in fact, maybe you could get in. So let's see how that plays out. So now, yeah. okay, that's most helpful, uh, Nigel. Uh, let's watch whether Nifty Bank can yet again play a leadership role. It looks all set too. The numbers indicate that. Mm. Okay, now before we delve into the uh, show full uh, uh, tilt, let's tell you what's lined up uh, in the first half hour of uh, the show. We will get you updates from the markets across the globe. Steve Bryce of Standard Standard Chartered. Wealth Management will be with us to discuss the global trade setup. Later, our research team is going to bring you our top 10 list of stocks for the day. Uh, at around 8.30 a.m., we also will do a fundamental stock analysis check with Devin Choksi of KR Choksi. Okay, well, that's lined up on the show in the next one hour. But in the meantime, we have some opinion coming through for you. First up, it's Venugopal Gare of Bernstein who says that India outperformed emerging markets and emerged as the lucky lack of choice market for 2022 with macro resilience being the key word in a phase of global challenges. He says, while global macro risks appear to be peaking, moderating macro buffers for India raise vulnerabilities in 2023. He adds, while mean reversion will drive underperformance relative to China this year, India's early cycle nature will remain a crucial variable in dictating absolute returns. At a sector level, they are overweight financials and stay overweight on IT, but they allocate some weights to digital themes which appear more reasonable post the correction. They are also overweight on cement and they move to an overweight on durables. They are underweight on utilities, metals and FMCG and move to an underweight on industrials. Venugopal says that they are equal weight on auto. Okay, that's a bunch of cues to work with. Let's get to the money market uh, calls. Kunal Sodhani of Fershinden Bank says that the dollar returned with vengeance and soared against all its major rivals. It says annual CPI in Germany declined to 8.6%. In December, pushing euro dollar lower, he adds Brent crude prices and the 10-year US Treasury yields are lower, while the dollar index sharply bounced with uh, immediate resistance at 105.2. For the dollar rupee, Kunal says 82.65 acts as the support, while 83.10 is the resistance for three. Okay, so uh, what to expect from the Fed? That's exactly what everyone's going to think about. We have Steve Bryce, the Chief Investment Officer at Standard Chartered Wealth Management, joining us to help us parse the global queues. Uh, good morning, Steve. Thank you very much for spending time for us this morning. Uh, well, what are you expecting in the FOMC minutes? And irrespective of what is expected, is much of the bad news priced? Because we have seen for the past couple of weeks, the S&P, the Nasdaq and the Dow actually, you know, falling rather steeply. So, I mean, on the first thing, obviously, the, the Fed's inflation outlook, they, they revised up their inflation outlook. So more information as to why that why they did that, I think, is going to be really important uh, for investors um, to see whether the data that's come in recently uh, sort of fights that. If they're focused on the labour market, the labour market still looks pretty tight. Yes, we've seen uh, job offers, which obviously is due tonight, that they have started to come down, but still massively, massively above pre-pandemic uh, levels. Uh, initial jobless claims are nothing to worry about. So, you know, if you're looking even at the, you know, coincident indicators of the labour market, it suggests that the Fed still may feel it has some work to do. Um, in terms of it, is this price? I think increasingly this has been priced, obviously, by, by uh, rates markets. Um, you know, I, I th we do believe that we will actually, um, they'll, they'll over-tighten. So we liken it to, you know, going to a buffet and eating, uh, eating a lot of food very early and then getting indigestion later. Um, so we think the Fed will over-tighten and that will lead to the need to cut rates later in the year. Um, but for the focus in the near term, I think it's going to be, we still think we're heading into recession. Um, and, and therefore, we do think there's still another leg down from an equity market perspective. 
Okay, so we're heading into a recession and perhaps another leg down for equity markets. Steve, good morning. Do you think India can buck the trend because we've been doing that so far? Yeah, it's been very resilient, right? So, I mean, within the context of our asset allocation models, we are overweight Asia X Japan. Within that, we switched from being overweight India at the end of last year uh, to being neutral and, and switched to being overweight China. Obviously, that's working out pretty well for us at the moment, given the performance of the China markets. Um, you know, nothing wrong with India. India's, uh, you know, India's uh, stock market's holding up well. Um, but, you know, relative performance, we expect China to outperform. Uh, as we move through certainly the first half of this year, and then we'll see how things sit. All right. Hi, Steve. Morning. Uh, you know, you said that maybe a recession could come about. That's what you're factoring in. And then a bit of a uh, pullback in equity markets. What could that be? Uh, you know, what are you penciling in? A 10% or 15% or is it more? Um, I, I think we'd probably say more, um, you know, given that the fact that we've, we've rallied so strongly from the lows is that you know, the first question alluded to, uh, we could see, you know, the, the the U.S. stock market fall quite quite markedly um, back to sort of towards low three thousands level um, at some point before before we form a base. And obviously, then you see people looking forward to the you know, the ultimate recovery, and assuming the Fed does pivot away from slamming on the brakes, which is what it's doing at the moment, to actually you know t initially taking the foot off the brakes and then ultimately putting a foot on the accelerator at some at some point uh, later in the year. Um, so, so that's the sort of magnitude of, of, of potential weakness that we see uh, for the U.S. stock market. So Steve, you're talking about a 25 percent drawdown on the S&P 500. Um, well, I mean, yeah, so maybe 3,300, I think, is, is, is really critical support. Um, but, you know, yes, we, we wouldn't rule out you know, another 20, 15 to 20 percent, certainly, uh, downside from here. OK, that's big, uh, uh, Steve. Uh, yes, sir. Even uh, in 2022, we weathered a 20% drop in the big indexes in the US, and the Indian uh, uh, Nifty moved up 4% in rupee terms. Okay. Now, what's yeah. the expectation in, in uh, 2023? Do you think a similar outperformance, a marginal uptick uh, in Nifty? Uh, w what are the options? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, for us, the critical piece for the story is, is, is what happens to currencies, right? So, obviously, the, the rupee has been a bit on the back foot uh, in, in, in most of last year against the backdrop of a very strong dollar globally. Uh, we yeah. do expect, we've obviously already seen the dollar weaken quite considerably uh, from the highs uh, globally, less so against the rupee uh, so far. But I think that, that redu reduction in pressure uh, from the dollar strength and, and, and further weakness uh, as we go through the year, we think that will be a good backdrop for Asia generally and obviously for India as well, especially if oil prices don't uh, continue to rally or, or rally further from here. Um, so from that backdrop, you know, India probably modestly higher, not dramatically higher, okay. um, but still, you know, delivering decent returns. Since you are, have switched from overweight to neutral in India, you also believe that there's a recession coming. Do you think that uh, equities as an asset class may move to the back burner this year and there are better returns perhaps in gold or even in debt? Yeah, so it depends where you're looking. If you're looking globally, we certainly believe that's the case. So we're overweight investment grade um, corporate bonds in, in the developed market world and we have a, a, a also, a, a, sorry, we're neutral there, but we still think the, the yields there are attractive in Asia. Uh, we are overweight in high quality debt as well. Uh, again, seeing flows um, picking up into that asset class, obviously with the, uh, you know, the property situation um, becoming much more calm in, in, in China being an important point. If we're looking closer to your home in India, uh, we're actually pretty balanced between in, um, bonds and equities. Um, so within equities, we have a tilt towards uh, large cap companies, which where we see earnings growth resilience and, and valuations looking more attractive, margin of safety looking good as well. Uh, and in, from a sector perspective, preferring the domestic economy, we see domestic economic resilience in, in India relative to what's going on elsewhere. So preferring sectors such as financials, um, industrials, consumer staples uh, in India, as we believe those will be more resilient as we head through 2023. All right, Steve, final question then on the dollar index. You know, it went around 150 odd. I recall you telling us that you believe that it's not yet peaked out at around 104 and a half odd. Uh, where do you see this one headed? <laughs> yeah, so we've been, uh, obviously, you know, we, we've been bearish on the longer term outlook, think, but thinking that there's, there could be some short term strength coming through. I guess, given our Fed view, that maybe there still is some um, tightening yet to come and maybe that could surprise a little bit on the upside. 
that could give the dollar some support in the short term. But we'd be looking at any rally, any rally in the dollar as a good opportunity to sell on a 12 month basis. OK. All right. We will leave it at that. Uh, Steve Bryce, pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining Thank us and have much. a fabulous 2023. We are still meeting you in the first you. week of the year. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right. Uh, with that, we'll take our first break for the morning. And uh, before that, our list of, OK, after the break, our list of top 10 stocks lined up for you. Saha Polymers Limited, IPO of 1 crore 2 lakh equity shares of face value of 10 rupees each with price band of 61 rupees to 65 rupees per share. Offer opens on Friday, December 30, 2022 and closes on Wednesday, January 4, 2023. For risk factors and details, please refer to the offer document available on the websites of SEBI, Pantomath Capital, the book running lead manager and the stock exchanges. Cashless hospitalization is easy. Get details on our network hospitals at www.starhealth.in. Always at your doorstep. Retail investors should develop the habit of examining and reviewing their transactions and trading accounts on a periodic basis. Make sure there are no surplus funds lying idle in your account. It is also advisable to insist on regular settlement of your trading account. Smart investors opt for a monthly or quarterly settlement to keep track of both funds and securities. If you notice any discrepancy or error, you need to immediately bring it to the notice of your broker and get satisfactory response within reasonable time. For unresolved issues, contact your nearest NSC Investor Service Cell for assistance. एनएसी द्वारा निवेशकों के हित में जारी Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Hope you're having a good morning so far. The SGX 50 is indicating that the bulls may not have such a great morning uh, considering the global backdrop is a bit on the lower side. Uh, we have a lot of micro cues to watch out for today. So let's get straight to that. Nigel, you're watching Vedanta this morning. Well, Vedanta in the last half of trade actually yesterday, the stock did see a bit of a spike off. We pull up the intraday chart. It was trading more or less flattish and then it went to around 320. Also, just an alert for our viewers. The operational update, well, nobody is out there. You know, it looked pretty okay. Aluminium, uh, well, that was up, uh, that was down by closer around 2% on, but that's par for the course on a year-on-year -year basis. The zinc international business, we're not looking at the domestic business because we already have Hindustan zinc that have uh, delivered dumpers. So zinc international mine metal was up by 32%. That's because BMM, which is Black Mountain Mine, well, that did see on a low base a bit of an increase of close to around 50%. That's what helped the international zinc business. The average day, uh, daily gross uh, volumes in the oil and gas business, well, that has been struggling. So on a year-on-year -year basis, it's low. However, on a sequential basis, that's a little bit higher. So that's good news, uh, actually. Power business as well did come in high by close to 5%. There was higher PLF at uh, uh, TSPL. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, good news. And iron and steel, very small parts of their business. So given that aluminum was pretty much in line, oil is improving a little bit, and international zinc did well, well, we're going with green on that stock. But keep in mind, the stock did see a sharp spike in the last 10 minutes of trade. But banks, they're going to be top of mind. Abhishek joins us to tell us about Indus and Bank's operational update. Abhishek? Uh, well, Nigel, it's a strong operational update coming in from Indus and Bank, especially on the loan growth front, which on a YY basis is perhaps at a 12-quarter high. So to begin with, uh, deposit growth is at 14.3% YY and about 3% uh, sequentially. Uh, the CASA ratio has actually dipped a bit uh, given the fact that, you know, uh, the non-CASA portfolio of the deposit side has grown largely uh, ha or higher than the CASA. So CASA ratio is at 7-quarter low of 42%. Calculations shows that it's up 2%. However, retail deposit, that takes the sheen away from CASA given the fact that retail... Uh 
term deposits have grown by more than 6% quarter on quarter. So the advances growth, that's pretty impressive, 19% on a YY basis, which is perhaps the highest rate that you are seeing in terms of growth rate in the last uh, 12 quarters. So it's up about 19% YOY and 4.55% uh, sequentially. Credit deposit ratio has improved, which suggests that margins could improve on a quarter on quarter basis. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Just want to mention that a lot of upgrades coming in on Indusind Bank this morning. CLSC has in fact upgraded it Indusind Bank to a buy from an outperform. And they have raised their target price to 1500 which is a big upside to the current market price. We'll keep tracking that closely. Uh, Mangalam is with us to tell us about DMART's performance. Look like a solid showing, Mangalam. Well, it's a steady showing uh, for DMART. And uh, the reason why it looks strong also is because it's the seasonally strong quarter. So, Quarterly uh, revenues for the third quarter for the company have been the highest. Year on year, it's a growth of almost 25 odd percent. The three year revenue CAGR, if you account for you know, the COVID related issues, etc., as well, has been around 18 and a half percent. So, no problems out there. It is steady as she goes. 8.8 percent growth quarter on quarter, and that's because uh, it is a seasonally strong quarter. They've added four, quarter, uh, four stores in the third quarter, and in this year itself, they've added about 22 odd stores. So, uh, you know, uh, if you look at it from a store uh, count basis, the year-on-year -year growth for uh, stores is around 16%. Add 9% to that in terms of derived SSSG, the growth is around 25%, and that's what the company has reported. The stock is down around 15% from its 52-week high. It's never been cheap, but at 73 times, it's pretty much in line with what it's been trading at in the past as well. So, see some green on DMART today. Okay, I see some green on DMART. We're also looking at green on the aviation stocks in Interglobe Aviation as well as SpiceJet. Uh, the skies are full, it seems. Domestic air passenger traffic is now back to pre-COVID levels. In fact, higher than what we saw since the COVID outbreak. In the month of December, the air passenger traffic has hit 12.9 million passengers. Now, just to put it into perspective, in December of 2019, we saw about 13 million passengers. And in Jan of 2020, it was 12.7 million passengers. So, we're back to pre-COVID levels in terms of air passenger traffic. In fact, in a, on a single day, that's on Christmas Eve, you saw 435 passengers, which was a record high on a single day on 2,904 flights. So, uh, Merry Christmas to a lot of those oh, people who were bet. in the air. And, uh, <laughs> My sympathies with those who were caught in the airport <laughs> and I know some stories there. But okay, let's get back to the banks because uh, they are the toast of the morning. Abhishek, uh, you also have numbers from Equitas and PSB. Punjab said that. Uh, well, for Equita Small Finance Bank, uh, RBI has approved the acquisition of up to 9.99% uh, by SBI Mutual Fund. So, currently, SBI Mutual Fund holds about 3.09% in Equita's bank and about 3.61% in Equita's holding. Remember that Equita's holding will be merged uh, uh, with the Equita's bank. So, that merger actually needs approval for any individual stake going above 5%. Uh, recently, we also had approval coming in for DSP investor uh, managers who post the merger will hold around 6% in the merged entity. So, uh, second approval coming in for uh, Equitas in terms of uh, stake above 5%. Punjab and Sindh Bank, they reported their business update for the first time. Robust loan growth seen over there. Uh, deposits up 9% uh, YOY and about 4% sequentially. The gross advances that grew by 17% YOY and about 5.84% quarter on quarter. So, the CASA is also up 11.3% YOY and about 3% percent sequentially casa ratio almost stable on a sequential basis credit to deposit ratio has also improved which suggests that in a rising interest rate scenario you could see upside in the net interest margin on a sequential basis back to you okay all right abhishek thanks a lot for that let's hop across to reema she's here to tell us about railtel as well as uh, lti mine tree reema Thanks so much for that. So, Railtel, it's an order win. The company announced that it's won an order worth 186 crore for a period of five years. And recently, the company, in towards the end of December, had also announced an order win to the tune of 98 crore. So, in the last fortnight, they've seen two big orders. So, that's a positive. The other one I'm tracking is LTI Mindtree because the company has seen its first big exit since the merger. Whole Time Director and Markets President Venu Gopal Lamba has resigned. Now, this news doesn't come as a surprise because post the merger, uh, Sudhir Chaturvedi and Venu Lamba were both given the same designation of President Markets. So, the expectation was between the two, one of them would resign and that's come through. But he's a big face um, and that resignation perhaps could, you know, dent the sentiment on LTI Mindtree ahead of earnings. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. So, perhaps there could be some sentiment weakness there. 
Uh, Surbhi is joining in. She's tracking Angel One this morning. How did the numbers look, Surbhi? Hi. So the numbers were better than the November business update that they had given. The gross client acquisitions was marginally up by 2% on a month-on-month -month basis. The number of orders that were up 22% this month. But remember, the number of trading days were also higher this month. The client funding book was up 18% on a month-on-month -month basis at 13.75 crores. They have gained market share in FNO segment and the commodity segment. FNO market share is up 71 basis points, and commodity market share is up 140 basis points, back to like. 53% uh, that they reported in October. So, green for Angel One. Okay, thanks for that, Surabhi. And uh, of course, the most important queue would be crude. So, let's get Manisha in. Uh, good morning, Manisha. Uh, crude slump. Oh, well, yes, the first full day of 2023, and we have seen a sharp decline in across energy gas commodities. So the crude oil prices fell 4% overnight, and with that, they have come off their one-month highs. $4 of a decline is what we are trading with. Heating oil prices have declined 5% overnight. Natural gas prices fell 10% overnight. And with that, many of these energy commodities are now at a pre-invasion level. But three factors which led to decline, one was the China PMI data, which has contracted for a fifth straight month in December, has now declined to 49. The second is the IMF warning that 2023 will be a tough year for growth in China, European Union and US. And third is that China has raised exports quota for refined oil products. That tells you that the domestic demand continues to be on the weaker side. From here on, it will be about the US Fed meeting minutes today and the US non-farm payroll data on Friday. That would give you further direction. Okay, all right, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. Well, here's a quick recap of all the stocks that we just covered uh, for you. Stocks with positive news flow include Innocent Bank, Avenue Supermarts, Vedanta, Interglobe Aviation, Equita Small Finance Bank, Punjab and Sindh Bank, Railtel Corporation, and Angel One. Well, stocks with negative news flow, they include LTI Mindtree and ONGC. All right, uh, let's do one thing. So many stocks to talk about. So we'll take a quick breather. We'll come back after a short break with Devin Choksi of KR Choksi Securities to talk about all of these names and later. Remember, MLM Financial came out uh, yesterday with its uh, disbursement numbers. Look pretty good. Ramesh Ayer of the company will be joining in to discuss their business update for the month of December. Stay tuned. Welcome back. I hope you're having a good morning. For starters, though, the SJX simply suggesting a bit of a pullback, maybe a 50-point downtick is what we're bracing ourselves for. But there are going to be plenty of stocks in news. And Devin Choksi of KR Choksi joins us for uh, some fundamental uh, stock analysis. Hi, Devin. Good morning. Uh, hoping for a good uh, 2023. Wishing you and uh, your team the best. Well, uh, Devin, you know, we've got banking updates that have come in. And a lot of them are looking quite good. What's your sense? Innocent Bank, that's the last one that came out with its update late last evening. Did you have a look at that? And what's your pick? Hi, Nigel. Good morning and wish you all happy 2023 as well. Uh, well, I think the, uh, the banking uh, the lending numbers, I think, are basically uh, coming up in a higher direction, I think, largely because of the fact that we are seeing a higher amount of credit offtake, particularly from SME, MSME, as well as I think from the corporate sector. And as a result of which, I think most of the private corporate sector banks who have been, I think, clocking some of the good accounts have started uh, reporting better than expected numbers. Earlier expectation was somewhere around 18% kind of a growth in the lending book. We are currently seeing, I think, 90 to 20 and 21% kind of a growth in the lending book for some of the lenders. And I would not be very surprised if this particular momentum continues. Largely because of a few facts. On one side, we already have uh, the higher amount of, I think, economic activity happening, particularly due to the infrastructure-led spending which the government is doing, is resulting into higher amount of uh, industrial product consumptions. And as a result of which, I think we are seeing the participation of large to mid and small size uh, enterprises into this activity, which is basically resulting into higher amount of trade off -trade. On the other side, the retail credit of tech, I think, is also continuing to do well uh, with the consumption increasing. And so is the situation with housing finance. So overall, I think it appears to be uh, a sustained activity continuing as far as I think the growth in lending book is concerned, and which I would like to believe that I think would continue for a good longer period. 
Okay, got that. Uh, uh, Devin, good morning. Uh, we've also got good numbers from D-Mart. Now, always a, a pricey stock, but I mean, that's a solid 25% growth. Uh, how do you tackle that one? Yes, Tata, good morning. Uh, well, I think the retail story continues, and I think the grocery business particularly, I think, is increasing to a higher amount of volume that growth. Uh, as we understand from this business, uh, the larger the kind of volume, probably I think a margin improvement also been seen. They have been systematically adding new stores, and as a result of which, uh, uh, the new store led growth, as well as I think from existing store, the higher amount of uh, uh, uptake I think has been witnessed. So that is another reason for which I think you are seeing the retailers like Demart, retailers like uh, Reliance Retail, continuing to report uh, relatively stronger numbers. Yes, you are right. I think it is an expensive story, but at the same time, I think in this market, people would like to see the sustainable growth happening. And that's where I think probably they are buying the uh, stories in Demart or even for the country lands uh, retail. Who remain uh, confident about it? Maybe I think the good time to buy in this kind of uh, companies, I think where the valuations are expensive, is during the crash or a correction in the market whenever it happens. Okay, got that. Devin, good morning. Do you like aviation stocks? I know there is this issue about, you know, uh, ATF prices, etc. and profitability. But now uh, things are really improving, especially on the top line. Would you put money afresh in names like Interglobe? Yes, Sonia, good morning. Uh, well, I think uh, we have always been mindful about the fact that uh, this particular business is extremely volatile business. In a good season, probably, I think you end up getting higher amount of revenue and the profit. And in not so good season, I think you are also getting impacted badly. So to a greater extent, I think for a long-term investment, uh, on a sustainable basis, this particular business is very unpredictable, as I see it. However, at this point of time, I think given the kind of uh, uh, seat load factor that we are experiencing, uh, in my viewpoint, I think this particular business is going to grow relatively better. Especially because I think the crude oil prices and the, uh, the fuel prices are remaining more or less stable. I think we should be seeing a continued better performance in the next few quarters. As I said, I think predicting for a longer period, I think is a little difficult in this business, given the kind of uh, vulnerability that we have with the data. But the fact is, I think that I think at least next two, three quarters, it appears to be a relatively stronger period for aviation business in particular. Okay. Yes, sir. Fair enough. You know, now this is a big question, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a big stock, but the story really is buying Socio. I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with that brand, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, back in the old days, Socio was a huge beverage in rural <laughs> India in particular, bought by Reliance Consumer. Uh, Devin, overall view on the stock, I mean, uh, they seem to have an insatiable appetite to buy brands. Yeah, Lata, I think the very important part of uh, retail business is that if you have your own brands, then probably I think you have relatively better margins to talk about. Otherwise, the retail business uh, world over, has ex one has experienced that I think the margins are always complex, it is always under pressure, and always I think the smaller rate of margin get you on. However, I think the successful uh, companies and the companies with a deep pocket like Reliance Retail, would continue to buy some of the uh, uh, brands, I think, which they would be in a position to probably market it for a better margin. I would not be very surprised if I think we see a uh, margin uh, performance of Reliance within, which is currently hovering around 7% or so at the beta level, I think reaching in the direction of around 8 8.5% going forward, given the kind of acquisitions that they have been doing in some of the consumer brands. So I think that's an, that's an area where I think one will keep an eye on successfully adding the stores on the ground, creating the omni-channel kind of a presence through the uh, digital platform, and at the same time, I think creating their own brand portfolio uh, with multiple products. I think it's a success story that they are scripting. So definitely one remains positive and confident, especially with the size that they are creating at this point of time. Okay, well, Devin, just stay on. We'll come back to you. m and Finance reported a good uptick in collection efficiency, strong disbursements yesterday. So the company is on our radar after the Q3 business update. Um, remember, it was a 16-quarter high in terms of disbursements. But this has failed to translate into business growth. In more highlights, the company's asset quality as well as collection efficiency has improved. Ramesh Ayer, Vice Chairman and Managing Director at m and Financial Services, joins us now. Uh, Mr. Ayer, good morning and Happy New Year to you. 
how has the growth been in the rural markets and what kind of loan growth are you looking to do over the next uh, a couple of quarters? So, you know, the rural sentiments are pretty positive and we talked about it even in the previous quarters and I said that they are doing pretty well. The footfall at the dealerships continue to be good. All the economic activity around there, whether it's tourism, whether we are seeing on the road projects, uh, any of the activity you take which drives to growth of rural is doing well, including the farm cash flows are holding up pretty good. So I think overall, that's what is reflected in our disbursements. And uh, year on year, we are maintaining a 18% growth on AEM and we continue to believe that the trajectory is going to be the same. Uh, good morning, Ramesh. A uh, very happy new year to you. Uh, good numbers that you all reported uh, to light up your investors. Uh, but uh, cost of money, that's gone up. So how do you think, uh, I mean, if you can tell us how much cost of money has gone up, how much you're able to pass on and where the margins will be under pressure? So, you know, if we borrow anything fresh today, it is up by at least 150 basis point. The good news is that we have a good ALM match and therefore we don't need to really correct all our liability. So as far as our book is concerned, we have an impact of about 50 basis point as far as the borrowing is concerned. The overall average cost of borrowing goes up. We have been able to pass on about 25, 30 basis point. There is still a gap of 20 basis point, which we think we will absorb and not pass on immediately. We do believe that in the next two or three quarters, one should start seeing some correction to even the borrowing cost and that should help the margin better. For us, we have a lot of priority sector assets. Once we securitize, that should get us better margin and that should offset the 20 basis point gap that we are currently can. So okay. steady margins uh, is what you're expecting, unchanged margins? Uh, there would be some dip, definitely in a quarter or two. They would get corrected as we move along. All right, but NIMS of around 7.5%, I think, is what we were guiding for earlier. You're sticking to that. No, so I'm saying that will be dropped by about 20 odd basis points. 20 odd basis points, all right. Uh, you know, the other query, Mr. Ayer, is uh, there is a bit of a gap in the gross NPS uh, because of the, uh, you know, INDS as well as RBI. The question is, have you provided enough? There won't be any fresh provisions that will be required, right? So we've stated that even in the previous quarter, even in this quarter, that there will be no additional provision required because of the IRAC norm. Because uh, if you look at our coverage, we are carrying a 58% plus coverage the net NPA for us is about 2.5, 2.6. And the RBI requirement under the IRAC is a 6% net NPA. And that leaves us with sufficient provision that we are already carrying, therefore not required to make any further provision. Okay. Any worries at all about uh, asset quality? You know, your stage two uh, amount of, uh, um, you know, co uh, collection efficiency is the same as the quarter ago. So no worries there. But, uh, I mean, what is the gut feeling? I mean, if you look at uh, a year back, we had the worst uh, scenario yes. out. We stated that more than 85% of it would get corrected. In fact, we have corrected more than 100% of it in less than three quarters of that. So rural is a typical market, as all of us know, and the third and fourth quarter are the best. And we are seeing cash flows holding up pretty good. So we don't see any worry on any front. On the stage two, in fact, you see this continuously coming down. So if you look at our stage three and stage two together, over any period of the previous quarters, it's shown continuous decline. So okay. the trends are pretty much holding up there. Uh, is there any risk to this 18% loan growth target, considering that inflation could perhaps hit uh, consumer spending? I think, uh, you know, most of these assets bought are for their commercial use. And therefore, if there is a demand for that vehicle, I don't think they get so much pressurized to buy the borrowing cost going up, et cetera, et cetera. They look at how can they pass on the rate to their consumers finally. And that seems to be happening. So we don't see any pressure on the disbursement at this stage. As I said, footfall at the dealerships are pretty, pretty aggressive. Uh, the reason I ask is because you also cater to the two-wheeler sector and car loans as well. And uh, two pockets, two-wheelers and small cars, have been facing a bit of pressure over the last six months. There's been no real recovery there. Your thoughts? So, two-wheelers, we are not a very active player, but yes, car, we are. What we see is in the small car segment, people actually are willing to pay a little more and move towards a pre-owned little bigger car. So, if you look at our pre-owned vehicle growth in this quarter has been one of the best ever compared to the past few quarters. So, I think that gets offset. And then when you get demand from pre-owned vehicle, the margins also start to improve because the lending rates are better. 
Okay. Any guidance on the AUM, the, your total assets under management? What are the targets you have set internally in terms of growth? See, I mean, in this quarter, we had about 14,000 crore plus disbursement. Uh, we do expect that the future quarters would show similar numbers with demand being so high. And therefore, to maintain uh, asset growth of 18-20% should not be a big challenge compared to the previous year. Okay. Uh, Ramesh, any other nuance you can provide about the uh, company uh, operations in terms of any AI you all may be using? Uh, is there anything that investors would be excited to understand in terms of the operational running? So we are running a project called uh, Transformation within MMFSL. And uh, what we are really trying to do is use up the large database that we have and try and see what are all the cross-sell opportunities that we have for our consumers. And that's one that you will see us in the next couple of quarters showing a lot of traction out there. Uh, we are sufficiently and adequately investing in our technology and the digital space. And as you know, we've created a special vertical called the digital finance, which is for small ticket loan, including up to two wheelers. So that's mm -hmm. taking shape and you will see numbers coming from there in the next couple of quarters out there. And then the third piece is, you know, with the vast relationship that we have across the country, you know, our consumers are present in about 600,000 village. And we know for a fact that our existing customer themselves are a very large uh, you know, ambassadors for us to get us more business. And therefore we are running a direct marketing program where through our existing customers, we are able to actually bring a lot of new customers and about 15, 20% of our growth our business volumes comes from our direct resourcing. I think these three will really put us in a new shape in terms of growth and new volumes are concerned. Just one final question. You said 18% is your target in terms of AUM growth. Uh, in segmental performance, two pieces that have improved quite a bit, one is tractor loans and the other is MHCV loans. Can you tell us what kind of traction you see here and particularly for these segments, what is the growth that you see? So tractors, what we saw was in the previous round, uh, it was farm purchases which was happening. Now we see the contractors buying tractors. So clearly the haulage application is going up and we do believe that the retails on tractors will uh, maintain that kind of attraction even going forward. So for us, commercial vehicle is concerned, we are not a very significant player. Therefore, the growth should be looked at from a little lower base that we had. Uh, but we mm -hmm. do finance uh, LCVs and NCVs for less than five truck owners, etc and we are seeing some demand out there. But our bet really is we believe the pre-owned vehicle segment will show much more aggressive growth because the demand there is very high. The supply there even was slow because of the new vehicle non-availability, exchange programs were not happening. We now start seeing exchange programs pick up and therefore the pre-owned vehicle will show phenomenal attraction. Oh, that's good to hear. Thank you very much. That was a lot of nuances that you have helped us understand, uh, Ramesh. Thank you for joining us. Have a fabulous 2023. Thank you and same to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. All right, uh, Devin is still with us. Uh, Devin, thanks for waiting by. You heard the conversation. Your take on MMFSL and NBFCs in general. I mean, banks have stolen so much of the limelight that uh, uh, are you finding now good picks in NBFCs? Well, I think NBFC continues to be, I think, doing well. In fact, yesterday when I was reviewing some of the data, I think majority of the expansion in the loan book of uh, banks, I think, has gone towards NBFCs. And that means that I think the NBFCs are continuing to attract larger amount of growth in their businesses. Uh, I think they have been, I think, the larger borrowers for the, from the banks. In my viewpoint, I think some of the consumer-facing NBFCs definitely will have a better time, like of Bajaj Finance, I think would probably have relatively better time, both in the area of uh, white goods as well as, I think, the other consumer products, I think, in which they are present with their uh, discounted pricing model. I think this prop company probably remains, I think, one of the better of the lots. Though I heard this particular story from um, MMFSL, I guess I think they are equally uh, moving in that particular direction wherein a cross-selling is the new mantra that they want to adopt. And at the same time, I think whatever in previous quarters, I think they had the problems uh, with the recovery, etc. I guess I think they are behind. So probably henceforth, I think this particular company should be doing better going forward. Maybe I think a couple of more quarters of stability and then the confidence should be higher in this particular stock. All right. Uh, De <clears throat> Devin, I wanted to ask you about cement as well. We had the management of Shri Cement yesterday. They sounded pretty optimistic about quarter three and quarter four. In the final hour of trade, actually, we saw Orient Cement. That one did spike up. Valuation-wise, it's trading at a discount. 
there were some rumors about uh, you know possible takeover uh, i reached out to a couple of people and you know they said that they're not really in the know of it uh, what's your take on cement on the whole maybe the large cap names like a shri cement or the mid cap stocks that offer some valuation comfort like in orient cement in fact uh, i think we remain extremely convinced and bullish about i think the story in general for cement uh, as a whole in the country and the pan india players uh, like acc ambuja from adanis and uh, ultratech i think they would remain i think stronger picks as far as our portfolios are concerned however i think most importantly in the southern pocket there are many small and mid sized named companies i think which on a stand alone basis on a regional uh, area concentration i think may not be able to uh, survive this particular growth because of the requirement of higher amount of growth and resultant i think economics on that in my view point i think in that belt probably you would be seeing some amount of consolidation going forward and i would not be surprised if more players come forward and i think they start asking for some of the smaller companies to join in particularly those which are having the limestone uh, rights with them they are probably going to be the ones which would be picked up by some of the larger players uh, i we believe that i think uh, this particular story is likely to go and grow bigger as far as the cement is concerned and that is where one can keep an eye on companies which are basically expanding their capacity or which has laid down the road map to expand their capacity which includes the cement of course and among with that i think even dalmia also so some of these companies could definitely remain i think a strong pick along with the pan india players which i just mentioned All right. Uh, well, uh, Devin, just stay on. We will come back to you in a bit. Uh, before we slip into a break, though, let's tell you what's lined up for the next half hour. Up next, we'll bring you the top stock picks for the day from our technical and FNO experts. And later on, we'll decode the rally stock rally with our momentumizer segment. At nine ten, Nimesh will be there with the standout brokerage report of the day. And before the market opens in CNBC TV 18 Stocks Board, we will highlight all the top stocks in the news to focus on for the day. So don't miss out on that. We'll be back in just a bit. Welcome back. It's time we put technical cues on the table, and we have our technical experts joining us: Sudarshan Sukani uh, and Mitesh Thakkar Ravitas. Uh, good morning, both of you. Uh, let me start with you, Sudarshan. What's the Nifty trade, and is there a separate Nifty Bank trade, which seems to be the leader these days? Yeah. Good morning, Lata. You're quite right. The Nifty Bank is the leader, but luckily for us today, the trades are the same for both the indices. The Nifty and the Bank Nifty are both moving in a very narrow range. For the Nifty, the range is just 150 points for the last two days: 18,100 at the lower end and 18,250 at the higher end. Now, this 150 range will not sustain. we are going to see a breakout one way or the other on the upside or the downside luckily given the fact that the bank nifty is also in a range but is giving very clear indications that it's likely to break on the upside i would say the nifty is also a buying opportunity now keep a stop under 18100 and go long in the nifty there is a slow but soft undercurrent of bullishness coming out on the charts in momentum in both of them so today i would say buying is suggested for the nifty under 18100 stop and for the bank nifty with a 43000 a little lower than that stop loss go long for both okay that's nice to see after a while sudarshan turning positive over there but i take your point i mean the nifty has recovered about 2.5% from its december lows mitesh would you concur with the view that you know there is an undercurrent of a positive move in the index and there's a breakout coming perhaps what are your thoughts Uh, my belief is that good morning. Uh, that you know the Nifty actually, I'm still waiting for an hourly close of about 18 to 50 to 60. And today we might open with slight gap down, which will kind of undo the uh, strong closing which happened yesterday. So I think still holding my horses, but I think uh, once we get a close about 18,000 to 50 to 60 on an hourly basis, I think the rally, the, the pullback rally should extend possibly by about 100 to 150 points. So in that sense, we're trading with mild positive bias on, and that reflects in my stock picks as well. But I think yeah, the the index trade trade will happen only once we get an hourly close above eighteen to fifty. Okay, all right. Hi, Mitesh. Morning. What about individual stocks? Uh, on the individual stock side, Nigel, uh, I have three buys and a sell. On the buying side is uh, Grassing. Here I would recommend a stop. Uh, sorry, on the on the uh, selling side is Grassing. Here I would recommend a stop at about seventeen thirty six. 
and a target of 1680 on the downside. A uh, couple of insurance, uh, insurance names uh, gave a breakout yesterday. Uh, ICICI GI or ICICI Lombard. Uh, that's a buy with a stop below levels of 1250 and a target of around 1300 or 1300 plus is what I recommend. HDFC Life was another one. That was a buzzing stock. It's a uh, buy with a stop at 587 for targets of 610. And uh, the final buy call is on Havels. Keep a stop below 1110 here and a target of around 1160-65 on the upside can be looked at. Okay, got that. Uh, Sudarshan, your stocks? Well, uh, I'm looking at mid caps, which are deeply oversold, because we are already covering the large caps when we buy the Nifty and the Bank Nifty. Apollo Hospitals is my first buying idea. The stock has been going through a correction, but not a very deep correction. But it just says, suggests that it's finding support. Buy with a stop under 4,400. Britannia is my only intraday short, and you don't actually have to take intraday shorts unless you see the markets really wobble. So a sell with a stop above 42.95. Granules is a buy. The stock has been falling now for the last 15 days. That decline has stemmed a lot. It's now essentially flat. That's the perfect place to buy. Buy with a stop under 320. And Petronet, which is not a buy on dips, is on the verge of a breakout, new breakout. That's a buy on breakout with a stop under 214. Okay. All right, uh, gentlemen, thanks a lot for that. We will keep coming back to you for more calls on the market and on specific stocks. We'll have the pre-opening rates with us as well. We'll also get Naveen Trivedi of HDFC Securities to talk about big trends in the FMCG and the consumer durable space. So do stay tuned in for that.